four years back, she initiated a program called C3 Critical Care Center. C3 is a facility created on the lines of international standard and equipped with the best critical care that is an immediate need of sexual abuse survivor. The plan of services provided include trauma care, therapies to heal trauma, recovery from trauma, medical services, and legal aid. It also caters to the needs of rehabilitation and repatriation as per the case requirements. The vision of C3 is to care for each child of prostitution to help them get stable in every aspect of physiology, psychology, and assist them to get justice. This menace can only be stopped if the perpetrators are scared to do this business and their profit margin goes down. They have a, they have a group of trained staff in compliance with the government agencies and resource material, which is an extensive training for all, all their staff in care of the girls and self-care. In a short span of 12 years, she has been instrumental in impacting lives of 100 girls, many of those who were or may have been victims of trafficking or various forms of abuse. We are very delighted to have Angelica Gare talk on Mard Self in the process of rehabilitation. Over to you, Angelica. Okay, I was on mute, my bad. Okay, again, thank you so much, Crystal Light, for this opportunity. And I think it's important for uh, different organizations and like-minded people to come together to deal with such a big issue of uh, sex trafficking and human trafficking because no one organization can actually deal with the entire totality of and the way this whole issue is such a humongous issue. So thank you so much for bringing us all together. I'm going to just quickly um, share my screen and uh, start my presentation. All right. Okay. Um, so I've been given this topic uh, to talk about Mart self, which is a journey of pain, resilience, reclaiming self. Um, to begin with what I want to share with all of you, I'm going to talk about something that is extremely basic to just about everybody, even a child who is uh, an infant who does not have words to talk about, but understands that they're is a basic need which is important for their existence um, and that is sunlight food water air and shelter and uh, probably this is something that we get um, in our lives right from the beginning of when we are born until the time we are here on this earth and in a most unrestricted manner we have homes we get food and we get water and maybe there are times when we don't even think about these things as something that is so important for our existence um, I will get to the point of why we talk about basic needs of existence, um, but to get more clarity on the existence of that we have, we, I'll talk about Abraham Harold Maslow. He was one of the most renowned American psychologists and philosopher, and he argued that each person has a hierarchy of needs, and these needs must be satisfied. Um, and it can be ranging from your food, shelter, clothing, to your love and belongingness to a family, and reaching up to a place where you want to know the purpose of your life. As each of these needs are satisfied, the next level in emotional hierarchy dominates the conscious functioning. While this is happening, he believes that a true, truly healthy people, or a truly healthy people, um, were such self-actualizers because they satisfy the highest psychological needs and fully integrating their own personality. And why are we talking about uh, Abraham Harold Maslow's hierarchy of needs is because um, it is again something that is essential for who we are and who we develop into. So again, to uh, show you and talk about the hierarchy of needs, there are three basic, there are three categories of needs that we divide our entire life into. This is like we're talking about our entire life and what we require 
to actually reach to a point where we say that, okay, I know what is the purpose of my existence. I know that why am I here? So to talk about the basic needs, um, there are two basic needs of every human being, which is uh, your physiological needs, where we talk about food, water, warmth, and rest. Every individual, again, like I said, even a newborn baby would want to, would feel hungry, would need uh, warmth, would need rest, uh, would need security and safety. And uh, he or she as a child feels the need for it. And unless these needs are satisfied, uh, you cannot really move on to the other things. So these are the basic needs of every human being that needs to be met before you can actually move to psychological needs. And your psychological needs will talk about how you grow up as a person, what, your, what will be your personality, what will be your thought process, how will you um, become who you are at a certain age. So your need for belongingness, your need to be with family, your need to be loved, to be cared for, uh, to have friends, to have a social circle is your psychological need. Once that is met, you also get the feeling of accomplishment. It is our family and our friends and people who love and care for us who make us feel that we've accomplished something, that we have moved on in life, that we are successful. So the needs for prestige and feeling of accomplishment is something that is our psychological need and has to be met to move on higher in the pyramid of the hierarchy of needs. Once we have achieved these two uh, basic needs and psychological needs is when we can actually move on to self-fulfillment needs. And I think a lot of us at a certain age do feel that, okay, I know the purpose and the goal of my life. And a lot of people are maybe still finding or looking for it. Um, and this is where you achieve your full potential. You know where you want to be in life including your creative activities and so on and so forth. Why are we talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs? We would come back to that, but I would like for all of you to just keep this image in your mind while we talk about uh, the journey of children who are rescued from brothels and from prostitution of various kinds. Um, next is about, uh, about facts and about figures. So in 2017, 23rd November, Catalyst India, the organization that I work with, has a project called Critical Care Center. That's a project that deals with rescue, rehabilitation, repatriation, uh, long-term rehabilitation, all the things. So Critical Care Center, it's called C3 in short, we, along with the Delhi Commission for Women, the Child Welfare Committee, which is a children's court, and I'm sure you all know about that, an anti-human trafficking unit, which is a crime branch unit, crime branch unit that takes care of uh, the anti-human trafficking part, uh, rescues and settling girls and repatriation and stuff like that. So 23rd November 2017, all of us together conducted the biggest rescue which has happened um, up till now. And I know this for a fact because uh, last month we were with the HQ crime branch ACP and he did say that this was the biggest rescue he has done in all these years. So what happened in this rescue? So once the rescue was done, this is uh, next day's uh, report in the newspaper. And a lot of newspapers covered this report specifically because this rescue was done and uh, there were 17 the 19 girls, 17 girls that were rescued. Out of those 17 girls, only three girls were kept uh, to be sent to a long-term rehabilitation or whatever, but 14 of them were let go. Um, it was in media, it was in the press, it was a huge news all over. And uh, the DCW chairperson, Ms. Swati Malibal, was there herself to talk about this that uh, this is something that is not acceptable. Now to come to the actual story, what actually happened when uh, this rescue uh, was taking, uh, happened back then. So C3, as I said, is a project of Catalyst India. We have our Intel team, we have a rescue team, which is separate from a team which takes care of the rehabilitation process and repatriation process. So based on our intelligence, uh, we gathered information about a huge group of uh, underage girls 
in one particular brothel and we planned uh, the rescue accordingly. The crime branch uh, was obviously looped in, the local police was looped in and our CWC was very supportive to us and we looped them in as well. And uh, so crime branch had only two female staff, local police had none. Um, once the rescue was done, uh, I'll not get into details of that because that's not my topic, but once the rescue was done, there were 23 girls that were uh, rounded off that we could see visibly that they were minors and you can kind of see. And they were kind of brought in together along with their madam. Um, all these girls had Aadhaar cards that they quickly brought in uh, as per a suggestion of one of the police inspectors. And uh, all the Aadhaar cards showed that their age was 20 and above. Once the police saw that their Aadhaar card had their age 20 and above, they were unwilling to do the rescue. But we insisted quite a lot and that this rescue needs to be done and we know that they're underage. Um, and as a result of that, the entire onus of the rescue of bringing the girls down was on C3 female staff. Um, the girls were brought out along with their madam. The police bus was standing outside and everybody was put in there. Uh, the girls, the madam, everybody was put in the bus together. Once we reached the police station and the procedure or whatever that started, it was almost two and a half hours to three hours. The girls and the madam were sitting inside the police bus. There was no water that was provided. There was no food that was provided. The girls were picked up early in the morning at about 5.30, 6-ish. So they were all in their night clothes, half scantily dressed or however, but then they were there in the bus for all those hours. They were taken out only when one of the girls urinated in the bus. Uh, they were all taken to a room for counseling and along with the madam who was there dealing with them. And the madam constantly had an eye contact with the girls while uh, they were counseled. To continue with this case study, um, their testimonies were recorded um, and I'm sure if anybody has experienced the whole rescue operation, you know the attitude of the police, you know the attitude of people around them. So um, the testimonies were recorded in an extremely rude manner and uh, the police has, and a lot of people have that um, attitude towards the girls that this is where they're supposed to be. After 13 hours of rescue that we did, authorities decided that because the girls had a hard card and if their age was 18 and above, they were let go. That's where the whole media drama started. Uh, Swati Malival, ma'am, she called the media, the CWC was there, the, the, the commissioner was there, everybody was there, the media was called in and there was a huge hue and cry uh, that how come you let these girls leave, how come you let them go back to the same hellhole. Um, because of that, there was a re-rescue that was done and 17 girls were rescued again, out of which three were different from what we had rescued the previous day. All these girls were sent to Nadi and Ketan, which is a government shelter home, and their bone ossification was done. All were found minors. Once they were found minors, then that's when they were sent to our critical care center home. Now, that's where we go back to Maslow's hierarchy that I showed you the whole diagram. The first interaction that we have, the first impression that we call, the first impression is the last impression. And the whole idea of trust and security and safety that we talked about, which is a basic need, the idea of food and food and water, if nothing else, something which is a basic need for you to actually reach to a, reach to a place where you can have, uh, make them feel safe and make them trust you to be able to come out with you. Um, any kind of healing will happen only when your physiological needs are met. And we believe that rehabilitation begins at rescue. Um, when the girls are rescued, that's where the rehabilitation begins. And if you miss this big piece here, then the whole rehabilitation process in any kind of shelter home is pushed away for many months. And this is all out of experience that we talk about. Uh, when does this rescue become another big trauma for the girls? The police personnel were untrained. There were only two female uh, police there who were again untrained. They were not uh, sensitized about the whole issue. Uh, the, the safety of the NGO staff was compromised, which all the more kind of talks about how safe would the girls be when they're brought out with us if the staff or the people who are rescuing them are not feeling safe. 
there were girls out of this big group of 17 girls there was a group who were willing to um, uh, get out of this profession and then there was a group of girls who were not willing and then there was madam but all of them were kept together which was in a way enforcing the denial for everybody because they are scared. There was refusal of any basic human need. So there was no food and water given. Uh, it was early in the morning that they were brought out. There was nothing that was offered to them which would make them feel taken care of. There was uncertainty of procedures. So they did not have an idea what's going to happen to them next. And as all of us who work in... Um, this work in sex trafficking and prostitution, we know the kind of uh, mind wash that is done when the girls are there at the brothels. They are told that once you move out, you will be at the police station, you will be behind bars, and this is what's going to happen. We make sure that everything that they hear is uh, true to the last word. So again, ref refusal of basic human needs and un uncertainty of procedures, which leads to a lot of mistrust. It leads to a lot of shame. Uh, there, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of blame. So instead of them feeling rescued, they're more treated as a criminal. There is fear, there's humiliation. Where does uh, C3 or our project comes in? We see each of these children as survivors and not criminals. Um, we learned a big lesson through this rescue and uh, we started making a lot of protocols which was missing, at least I know of Delhi which was missing here that once a child is rescued, what kind of protocol needs to be followed so that the coming days and her future is more, um, she feels more safe, she feels more secure with people who are rescuing her. So providing essential immediate, essentials immediately after rescue, something as small as just uh, giving them a cup of tea, uh, providing them with basic um, breakfast maybe, or making sure that uh, they are clothed properly, um, anything like that, that just makes them feel good about themselves. Maybe a dental kit so they can brush their teeth or just water for that matter. Uh, we make sure that the doctors and the medical staff that, who does the MLC, the medical, medical legal cases that they deal with, they are sensitized. Because we've had cases where uh, a male doctor will actually do the MLC and he literally, I was shocked when I heard that, but the male doctor asked one of these survivor children take off your clothes let me know where it hurts what do you do where does it hurt what happened to you that was more traumatic than any of our experiences because when they're in the brothel they're settled so we sensitize the doctors and the medical staff uh, before the children are taken there there's a lot of trust building that needs to be done even with the team who's there um, taking care of the girls and our social workers join uh, them once they're there uh, with all the procedure that's happening. That is important for a child to feel safe and secured with somebody and they can trust. Um, we've had uh, trainings and we still continue to train and sensitize the anti-human trafficking unit who are dealing with survivors because they are the ones who um, are the first uh, interaction that they see of police. And of course, they don't really have a very good uh, reputation in a, in a sense. But if they would see police understanding and being sensitive to who they are and where they're from, um, it would help them build that trust. So we train and sensitize them. When they're taken to shelter home, we make sure that even nothing has to be fancy. It is just very basic. It needs to be just a clean and safe a bus or a, a car or whatever wherein the transfers are made. Again, these are essentials that helps you with any kind of rehabilitation that has to take place in future. Um, C3 as a home uh, is something of a concept that we believe in, which is called therapeutic milieu, which means that every step, everything that is placed uh, at the home, every wall that is decided of how and what we need to put there, every activity that we do with the girls would be therapeutic for them. In some way or the other, it will help them to... Um, when doubt, it will help them to express themselves. It will help them to be children again, because that's who they actually are. We have male and female guards. Um, the security system is such that uh, we have electronic security. So we have these RFID cards and you have to put your card to just open doors and gates and stuff like that. So we've made sure that there is enough security as well as it does not look like a jail. 
So we had to, as per the JJ Act and as per CWC, we had to cover our balconies, our staircases, because it's a five-story building. So our staircases had to be secured so that nobody kind of jumps in. All that is done, but it is done in the most creative ways possible. So that does not look like a jail where they've come out from. Uh, we also developed a concept of Garden of Life, so where we had this space where uh, each new girl who comes in would plant a tree, would plant, would actually sow seeds in a small pot and would tend and take care of that plant. So as soon as and when they see that plant growing, that is who, who they are. They associate them with their own life. We are the pot the activities that are happening is the mud that is given for them to grow into a beautiful plant. So that's the whole idea. And we do explain it to them in the most uh, uh, normal language that they can understand. It is well lit and ventilated. So everything that they did not get there, all the things that we talked about is something very basic to our existence is something which was taken away from them. And that is what we're providing. Beautiful and bright colored interiors. So our curtains and our bed sheets, everything are like floral. Good, good. Because girls like that, it's colorful. Um, so all our residential floors have kitchen areas, but they're all uh, fireless. So we don't keep cutlery. We don't keep anything that they can use to harm themselves. We have a separate kitchen area. They have their dining area. So they would go there, eat their food, wash their utensils and keep it on the side. But nothing goes up on the residential floors because we don't want them to hurt themselves. We've even removed all the latches from their bathroom and bedroom doors because we don't want anybody to uh, lock themselves in. Uh, we don't have wall fans, we, have, uh, see uh, we don't have ceiling fans, we have wall fans, um, again, so that they don't harm, harm themselves. We have a punching bag in a recreational area and that is something that we kind of talk to the girls about and it's kind of funny, but then there is, there's a lot of times when there is a need to just get out all the anger where you need to just vent it out. And instead of hitting each other, use the punching bag and take out all your anger. We have positive and feel more information of how beautiful they're created in, in life and future. Um, for the one is uh, because each life is worthy in itself, really in a herd. Each child, when they come to CT, when they come to a home, there is a celebration. We have a small cake for them that we come cut for them. If their girls are already staying, they would make a poster or they'll make a, a play card saying welcome home. They will make cards for the new girl. They will celebrate the new girl, come in and make her feel home, make her feel and, uh, do everything that will just help them express and be therapeutic. So we have music and dance because children love music. Children love to dance. And we've seen a lot of expression while they're doing that. We've seen a lot of girls um, use that time just to um, use their energies in the right and positive way. Um, there is again, art and craft, baking. And we've also realized that once, whenever girls create something, whenever these children create something and you have something that you created in your own hand, it gives you a lot of satisfaction, gives you a lot of happiness. Uh, we don't put them into very tight schedules because of course uh, we know that uh, their body clock was completely messed up. So it takes time for them to come back to um, a normal body clock. And we do teach them self-defense as well. We have uh, mental health interventions because uh, it is important for them to uh, be able to identify their trauma. I think it takes a lifetime to completely heal somebody from a trauma. But what we can offer them is um, to be able to identify their trauma and be able to manage it. And once they know they, they have a problem or they have something that they need to deal with and they know how to manage it, it becomes easier for them to get into a regular life. Uh, so as you can see, that there are uh, different kind of uh, trauma therapies that we provide to them. There is counseling that happens. Um, we make sure that everybody is able to tell their story in the right way. This is also extremely essential because uh, this helps them to lead a normal life, of course. It helps them to choose a different vocation. 
um, I know that the first batch that I ever dealt with, it took us almost about one and a half to two months for them to change their, uh, their saying from, oh, we want to go back to where you got us from. And from that to a change of, yes, DB, we want to learn what you want to teach us. We want to live a normal life. Yes, DB, we want to become better. So it takes time. It take, it's a slow uh, progress. Um, this also helps them to testify against the perpetrators, not just the first 164 that happens, but also make sure that they are empowered and strong enough that they want justice. They want these perpetrators behind the bars. Um, that is very, very important if you want to make any impact in um, combating uh, human trafficking. We've also seen in our experience that every one out of five to seven girls um, have compromised IQs. That is to say that they become a very, very vulnerable target to human trafficking and sex trafficking. Because one, they cannot tell their stories, right? Um, and uh, we've had girls who are about 15 or 16 years in their biological age. But uh, once we got their assessment done, they were only about five years, six months, or seven years, eight months of their mental age. The sad part is that that is what they're going to be even when they turn 50 years. So they become extremely vulnerable uh, to anybody uh, for any kind of abuse, sexual, physical, mental, verbal. So we make sure that once we identify uh, after the psychological assessment, we identify these girls and then we know that, okay, we need to take care of them in a different manner. So it is very, very important for these mental health interventions for them to be stabilized enough to get back into the mainstream. The role of staff, again, is very, very important. I hope I'm not exceeding my time. Um, the role of staff is very, very important. So we've made sure that each of our staff has gone through at least three to six months of training uh, where they understand uh, what is human trafficking because it is a new topic for a lot of us. I think even we, uh, people living in Delhi, I was born up, born and brought up in Delhi. I'm a pure Delhiite, but I think till the time I actually started working in this field, I did not really know that human trafficking existed. Uh, and I still uh, come across a lot of people who don't know that human trafficking exists even now, even in this city like Delhi. So it is important to make aware of uh, what human trafficking is to the staff who will be working with the girls. Um, it is important for them to be able to identify trauma. I'm not saying that all our staff would be able to address and deal with, I mean, address and be able to give any kind of therapy, but they identify and they are taught how to deal with trauma how to react when girls behave in a certain manner. I'll just tell you a very short uh, story or an incident that happened. That there was a group of girls who got really angry about something. Um, their temperament and their anger is very short circuit, so they got really angry. And as a result of which, uh, they um, just uh, threw all the pots and plants uh, on the floor, the mud from the plants were smothered all around on the walls. Even the CCTV cameras, so we have CCTV cameras all across in our building, except for the bedrooms and bathroom. But apart from that, all uh, common areas have CCTV cameras. So they, they threw mud balls on the, uh, the CCTV cameras. It was a complete mess. Um, and as they expected that we would react in a way that we would get mad at them or we would punish them or we would probably call the cops on them or call some other authority or something like that. But we did not do that. To their surprise, we didn't say a word. On the contrary, we were like, we understand. We know what, we can't even comprehend what you've been through. And we want to be there with you side by side to be able to take care of you and for you to be able to take care of yourself. Next morning, without us having to say anything, the girls got together, decided among themselves, and they cleaned as much as they could, but they cleaned the entire floor. They picked up all the mud, they cleaned the walls, they picked up all the pots and plants, and uh, they were given new ones, and then they planted the plants in the new pots. So that is something that we teach um, to our staff, and again, kind of um, grows onto us. Uh, of course, there is a professional psychologist who comes to assess their mental and emotional health. We have trained counselors uh, who are there throughout the day with them, just involve them in different activities. Any of our external resource person coming to do any activities with them are also sensitized and prepared 
um, we don't want these girls to become um, something of a spectacle, but then for anybody dealing with them to know that um, it's sensitive and they need to be careful about how to deal with them. Each time a girl goes out for any kind of court hearing, we make sure that there is additional security again because they need to feel safe. They need to have that confidence with us so that uh, they can be themselves when they are out in the world. Um, our house mothers again work in morning and day shifts um, because it is important for the house mothers to stay alert and up even at night um, as well as in the day. So um, I think that is all I wanted to share. Um, there is nothing to be built or there is nothing that cannot be mended. It's just about the approach you want to take. It is just about what and how we see a life, how much of a worth we see in a life. And that helps you to just mend any relationship, mend broken hearts. Um, Catalyst is a complete package, or C3 as a project is a complete package. We take care from, from rescue to rehabilitation to long-term rehabilitation, repatriation, and the whole gamut of it. Uh, but I was restricting myself because this, that was my topic. Um, so thank you so much. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, I would be happy to answer. I'm sorry if I've exceeded my time, but thank you so much. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, I love how you ended that however broken it is, sun is going to rise again. Uh, yeah, with that uh, note, we would move on to our next phase uh, through the journey of a survivor. Uh, we will take the questions at the end once all the facilitators uh, finish their speech or the presentation. Uh, so next we're going to have um, a presentation on who am I, how, um, you know, 